what does the most up-to-date research have to say about the health risks from using a cell phone? Well, I can tell you that the National Toxicology Program, which is the U.S. gold standard, last year released a preliminary draft of their analysis of the impact of cell phone radiation on uh, the brain and heart in, uh, and found significant increased rates of rare malignant tumors of the brain and heart in animals exposed in their lifetime to cell phone radiation. Having said that, I can also tell you, as I document in my book, Disconnect, which I believe you have for sale here, that industry has taken the tobacco guidebook about how to create confusion and disinformation, and they have run with it, and they have made the tobacco industry look like amateurs. There is so much doubt in the public mind about cell phone radiation. You see it in the headlines, which I'm going to show you tomorrow, of how this story of the National Toxicology Program has been covered. For example, there is a claim that the National Toxicology Program was not peer-reviewed. That is, to be polite, nonsense. The French have another word, merde. Um, there is the claim that the pathology review, which went through a triple blinded pathology review, was in fact not blinded. That is also nonsense. But these claims get hyped in the media. And we live in a world where some of us have a president who says there are alternative facts. And unfortunately, in science, we are seeing the suffering and the diminution in belief in scientific research with a concordant cut in funding for that research, by the way. So the US government is not funding research in this issue. And as a consequence, we will have a delay. The latest science research that's been done outside of the US shows damage to sperm, damage to reproduction, damage to hearing, damage to learning, damage to pregnancy, as well as an increased risk of cancer. Almost all that work, except for the National Toxicology Program, has been done outside of the United States, and we always like to call for more research, because calling for research is a lot easier than actually changing policies, as I think everyone on this table would agree. Just while we're on it, um, you, we're talking about cell phones. What about um, wireless, you know, if someone's in the house has wireless, is that different? Like, in other words, if a, there's a cell phone to your ear, there's a cell phone on speaker, there's a cell phone on the counter, there's a cell, cell phone in the other room, there's wireless, like, to what degree are we talking about, what, what, are, we, what are we saying? The electromagnetic spectrum goes all the way from the thing that turns on these lights in this room to the thing that's powering this wireless mic right now to cosmic rays and x-rays, that's all part of the spectrum. Is there anyone in this room who's sensitive to wireless? There are people who are sensitive to wireless, right? They know it, and it's hard for them to spend a lot of time in an environment like this. It is. And for those individuals, wireless, which is what the cell phone is, it can use, or it can be connected through the internet, through your internet provider, can be harmful to them. And there's no question about that. For most people, it's not doesn't affect most people that they know of. But there are effects on heartbeat, on tachycardia, on atrial fibrillation, and breast cancer in young women, and a number of other things that we are seeing increase, such as colorectal cancer in younger persons, thyroid cancer, a rare cancer of the cheek called parotid gland malignancy, and a tumor on the hearing nerve called acoustic neuroma. And those are things that we can say with some confidence, unfortunately, we have human data. Animal data, we have big debates about, but I want to ask you all this question. How come we use animal data to produce drugs and test drugs, and then when we find results in animals from environmental chemicals, we say, well, we better wait for proof of human harm. There's something wrong with this picture, and that's unfortunately, as you, I think we would all agree, that's kind of where we are. We say, well, we don't have proof of human effects. Well, yeah, you know, what kind of proof do you want? How many people have to die? How many people have to get sick before we accept that there's evidence? My colleagues and I at Environmental Health Trust represent scientists from around the world working on this. We believe at this point that the evidence is strong enough to justify basic precautionary steps, and that means that wireless radiation, like cell phone radiation, be kept away from the body 
as far as possible, and that people who are sensitive have the right to live in a world where they can go out and not be fearful of what they're going to feel like. I'd like to add something, um, just anecdotally, it's not research, but this is my own observation. So I go into people's homes to help them detox, and so I have these series of um, meters to measure electromagnetic fields. And I remember one of my clients, uh, a woman had called me in because she wasn't sleeping well at night, and so I kind of fixed the fields in her bedroom. Sometimes we turn the, the circuit breaker off in the bedroom to kind of lower the fields. But I, I walked into her husband's office. He, was, he had a home office. And she said, you know, he doesn't believe in any of this. I said, okay. So I go in, and he's sitting next to the, um, the, the Wi-Fi tower. It's literally on a shelf in line with his head. And if I tell you that the field on this thing, <laughs> it's beyond belief. It was like, you know, 1,000 would be high. This was like 20,000. And I was so alarmed, and I said, you can't sit next to this thing. You know, you, you need to move away. So he, he moved away, you know, a few feet, and we were talking, everything. He just kind of was like not paying attention. And then I said, how's your health? And he goes, oh, my health is fine. So we leave his office, and his wife pulls me aside and said, his health isn't fine. He just had throat cancer. And it was like, you know, I, it, for me, it was such a, you know, a, a correlation without a doubt, that, um, and for him it was like, you know, it, it didn't mean anything, and so she said there's nothing that she can do to convince him, but, you know, she just wants to take care of herself, and so and that's, I mean, some people are just um, av avoidant and in, in the dark. Oh. I want to just add one thing to that, too, because what I just heard from both of you are the research and the anecdotes that um, that show a clear line between EMF, uh, electromagnetic radiation exposure, and say cancers like you just described, or you know other kinds of ways that it impacts the heart. One of the things that is has come out more recently is how exposure to Wi-Fi, EMF, uh, electromagnetic radiation can actually slip your body into the sympathetic state when it should be in the parasympathetic state. So it affects the nervous system. And the, so what that means is in the sympathetic nervous state, that is when you are in kind of your fight or flight, um, whereas the parasympathetic nervous state is when you actually do your healing. So I'm a believer in the, the theory of total load on your body. And as Deborah explained before about your membranes becoming more permeable in a state when you have exposure to radiation, it's the same kind of um, premise that when you are, you know, that makes it, things more toxic to you. But if you are in a sympathetic state all the time, you never heal. So if you have low-grade inflammation, say from allergy or from toxic exposure or because you're developing heart disease or whatever it is, if you're a child with autism, you are in a chronic state of inflammation all day, every day. You need your, your body to sleep, to rest, to slip into a parasympathetic state so that your body can heal. If you do not slip into that state, you do not heal. So if you think about living in a house with your Wi-Fi on all the time, you are not able to heal. May, may I add just one practical thing? Those, how many of you have cordless phones? How many of you have the base of your cordless phone right next to your bed, the head of your bed? Okay. If you remove it, you will sleep better. Even if you're not aware of sleep disturbances, I promise you, that cordless phone is a mini base station, right? And it should, my, my advice is that those things belong outside of anybody's home, but if you have one, keep it as far away from where you sleep, from the head of your bed. I'm talking about the base station for the cordless phone, not, not all the little sets. And in fact, I'll talk tomorrow about how the state of California advised people to get rid of their cordless phones in their offices. And of course now, uh, all of the advice that comes from the government, unfortunately, that used to come from the government at the federal level has been corrupted. That doesn't shock you, I think. But we are seeing positive developments in the state of Maryland, in the state of Massachusetts, and the state of California, finally, on this issue. But they, the state officials who are experts in this field in Massachusetts Maryland and California have had to fight to be able to get their information forward. And fighting, as, as Beth just said, is what puts your body into a stress response. It's fight or flight. 
and all your adrenals get going and all your, you get it in the state of excitation. You need to heal in the dark at night. You need to sleep in the dark and you can either turn your Wi-Fi router off or make sure it's far away from where you're sleeping. It's really important for your health. And the evidence on bees I will talk about tomorrow because if it's, if it's hurting the bees, it's hurting all of us. Well, let me just take that question and go to a different question than what I was going to ask. Just let me uh, go right to that question. So um, what is colony collapse disorder and why should we care? Just a small um, piece. I, I want you to understand that out of the 24,000 species of bees in the world, seven of them are honeybees. Okay, out of the 4,000 species of bees in North America, none of them make honey. Okay, these are native. So we're all kind of focused on the honeybee. Um, colony collapse disorder is, a, um, is one of a series of maladies that the honeybees are facing. And it's also the varroa mite, and there's nosema, and there's American falbrood. There's probably 97 some maladies that are impacting the honey making bee. And it's probably the biggest picture, you know, I, I don't mean to poo-poo a honeybee, it's an awesome honey-making insect. Tomorrow I'll talk that it's actually not a great pollinator. Um, but when man messes with nature, we don't always get it right. Can I ask okay. you a question about that, and what you just said? The honey that we have in America that is being made by our local bees, mm -hmm. those bees are imported then, or they're not, they're not native to America? They're a European honeybee. Okay, they're the European honeybee. So we honey brought bee. them, the pilgrims brought them across with the dandelion. Um, I mean, they're, they're a sugar, it's a sweet substance, that's, we, that's why we brought them across here. But the pollinators are different. It is not a pollinating bee. It does pollinate. But it's not the primary pollinator. It is not the, um, how it carries its pollination. I don't want to get into this, but how it carries its pollination um, has us misunderstanding the bee. Okay? Because it's not a great pollinator, we're misusing this insect. And you take, if you look at orchards, you're taking a hive per acre. And these bees are actually a uh, five mile radius, two to five mile radius bee. And when you go out and take a, an insect and you misuse it, it wants to be about maybe half mile apart. But when you put them a couple hundred feet away, you find that the density, we're now talking a billion honeybees all overlapping, uh, you wind up spreading diseases where they shouldn't have been. So it's just pure bee density. If we took, I don't know, if we filled this room with maybe 5,000 people could probably fit. And then the four of us walked in with the flu for the weekend, you wouldn't want to be there. We are misusing, we, we think we know what we're doing. We are misusing an awesome honey making insect and, and worldwide messing it up. So all of these 90 some symptoms are a result actually of uh, the core cause we believe is bee density. Too many bees in one area has all the diseases and viruses and mites all being exchanged in the flower. It's just, it's just humans thinking they know I what they're doing. I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. Um, when people drive the trucks around mm -hmm. with the beehives, mm -hmm. the what you're beehives. saying is that that is making more density than the bees ought to have naturally and therefore contributing to the proliferation of disease among them as, as yes. well? Yes, and, and now recent uh, research um, is showing that when you put a honeybee hive wherever you're placing it, it's spreading its diseases to the native food-making bees. Okay, we're starving them because they take all the pollen back. I mean, there's, there's so many things that we're doing with the only bee of the world. Um, unfortunately, we are impacting the food making bees. And so yes, all of these hives that are being moved across the country are spreading diseases from the California almond industry to the, the Georgia peach orchards, but the bees all the way along, wherever these, these people stop with these bees, we're spreading the diseases that they carry to the native bees, just is. I mean, it's, I'm working, I'm working to um, enlighten people that there are other bees in the world that actually make food. You can raise them, they're gentle. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a long road, to, um, long road towards uh, changing what we know.